Dear Lord, work powerfully for the word of God that is before us today. Accomplish the purpose for which you send it. Work in our hearts to change our lives as you changed our eternities through your Son. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear friends, good to see you. As you know, uh, spring is steadily coming, as we saw the sun outside, which is great to see. And if you're a baseball fan, you perhaps know that spring training is back in gear. If you live in Arizona, you can go to the games. And because of this, I thought it might be okay to talk about baseball. Because of this, I brought a couple items with me today. Uh, the first item I have cleverly hidden under here is, uh, is this. Cubs hand. And uh, you can raise your hand if, if you're a fan of, of what this is and what it represents. Not so much. Okay, okay. <laughs> we'll set it here. But don't worry, I also brought something else um, for our baseball fans. Um, hidden under this part is uh, this t-shirt. Now, uh, you could uh, raise your hand if you prefer this uh, logo and frame. Okay. Very good. I'm not, I'm not trying to cause division. Very good, very good. All right, well, I wanted a crazy scenario for you today. What if, you know, I'm not going to do this because this is too crazy, but what if I were to wear this hat on the same day that I wore this t-shirt? Give you a, a look of how, how that might appear if you're like, I can't wear it over my suit. How do you like that outfit? What about other Chicagoans? Do you think they appreciate this outfit? What about Canerico with the socks? He, he saw you wearing this outfit. Would he give his thumbs up? Right. Starling Castro of the Cubs. Would he say, yeah, that looks good? No. No, right? Because everyone knows, and what I have learned living here, is that you can't be both a Sox and a Cubs fan. It, it just doesn't work. They do not mix. And, and, and you can claim that you're neutral. You can claim that you don't care. But finally, your heart will side more on one side than the other. Am I right? Okay. You know, enough about baseball. Maybe I can separate these or put them away, get them back to their sides. Okay, here we go. We're here to talk about much more important things. We're here to talk about the Lord, the one true God. And yet the reason I bring up this illustration of baseball and how you can't root for two teams equally is because the Word of God this morning makes it clear that you cannot serve the Lord completely and also serve something else. It just doesn't work. Either you will follow the Lord more, or you will follow whatever else that is in the Lord. And that is what we're talking about. Today we're encouraged to pick a side once for all. And today, through the Word of God, we'll have convincing proof why our decision be the Lord, and to serve Him alone. So we continue. And we're in this series, Elijah, and if I could, I just wanted to review a little bit of what we learned about Elijah. In the first week, we learned that Elijah had a really tough job to do. He lived in the worst spiritual time of Israel, and he was to call a whole nation of idolaters back to the Lord. A whole nation of Baal worshippers back to the Lord. Now it took a, a man of God to do this, and last week we discussed how he was trained as that man of God. What that training looked like. How the Lord isolated at the curious ravine. And how he learned to be humbly dependent on God. Saw his dependence as the birds were feeding. Ravens fed him each morning and night. Then he went on for advanced training in Zarephath lived with a widow. And there God provided for Elijah miraculously again. There was a jar of flour and a jug of oil that never ran out. They always had enough. Elijah was trained as a man of God to trust in what God could do. To trust in his power. But today is Elijah's biggest test yet. Today we'll see if the training paid off. Because today we consider perhaps the greatest duel there ever was, the battle between the gods. And I want to be 
to give you the background information before our lesson. If you remember, Elijah went before King Ahab, and he told King Ahab that there would be no, no rain. And because of this, there was a famine. And God kept his word to Elijah. There had not been any rain for three and a half years. Because of this, it was economic standstill. In fact, before the words of our lesson, the king at the time, wicked King Ahab, he sends his servants in search of grass. So dry are things become. He's in search of grass all over the kingdom so he can feed his animals. During this time, evil King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, they grew in increasing hate for the Lord. They hated him so much that he killed all the prophets. They hunted down anyone who claimed and preached the Lord and put him to death. They looked for Elijah. In fact, Elijah was a wanted man. They just could not find him. Well, today, Elijah, that wanted man, he has the guts and boldness to come face to face with Elijah, with Ahab, to stand right before the person who wants his, him dead. And, and this is pretty awesome. A uh, comparison today might be um, like if Osama bin Laden, bin Laden came out of hiding, and if he flew to the States, knocked on the Pentagon and said, you know, guys, I'm here. Incredible, right? That would be a, a bold, a stupid move. So here, Elijah seems foolish. This wanted man going before King Ahab, here I am. And yet he's bold because he said that God's command. Sent to tell King Ahab that there would be rain in the land again. And sent to propose a duel. And so as we pick up our lesson, we have that meeting between Ahab and Elijah. After years of separation, and, and please follow along with me now, verse 17. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. This is the word of God. Consideration there. Um, Elijah's using the I'm rubber, you're glue technique. I'm not the troubler, you are. Whatever you say bounces off of me and sticks on you. And truly it was Ahab who caused the trouble. He led the people away from the Lord to serve Baal. And because of this, God sent the famine. God sent no rain. All to turn those people back to the Lord. Elijah then goes on. And he proposes his duel. Here he goes, picking it up at verse 19. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel, and bring 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah to eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab did it. He sent word throughout all of Israel, and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver? between two opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. The people said that. And so here Elijah gets to the heart of the problem. The people were wavering. You see, it's not that they abandoned the Lord completely. They liked the promises of the Lord, the God of Israel. After all, he gave them the land they're living in, the promised land. They liked his promise of a Messiah. And they were looking for that promised one to come to redeem them and save them of sin. But they were also intrigued by this new God there. They liked the God of fertility and all the worship practices involved. Thought it clever to, to have him credited for the seasons and the crops and the growth. If you're a religious person, what they were trying to do is called syncretism. Syncretism, the mixing of two different religions trying to make one. But Elijah says, hold up. Wait a second. This does not work, guys. All right? This blending will not do. You are trying to mix oil and water. You are trying to mix cubs and socks. This isn't going to do it. 
And so he says, pick one. Pick one and follow. So what Elijah says to the people of Israel and to us today, what he points out and makes very clear is that half-hearted allegiance to the Lord is really no allegiance at all. It will not do. And the Bible warns us, Jesus warns us in another portion of Scripture about this same problem. Um, Jesus put it this way. He said in the book of Matthew, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And so we cannot serve two. And so... Today we have a, a bit of a gut check. And today I ask you, what in your life has the potential to take the number one spot over God? What in your life has the potential to take the number one spot over God? Is it money? It's a familiar one in the Bible. That we do all we can to get as much as we can so that we can live well, retire early, and feel secure. Is it a career? We put all our work, all our energy into a company so that people will recognize what we have done, recognize our intelligence and brilliance, so that we might have a lasting legacy. Is it image? The God of image, we want to to dress well, we want to eat well, we work out three times a day uh, because we want to look good and uh, eat only the healthy foods? Is it perhaps a thing? A house or a car? We spend all our time making that thing beautiful, waste all our energy into that thing alone. And finally, is it family? Is it a spouse or is it children? This might strike you at odd, but, but, but this can also be a false god. We have the temptation to elevate a love for our children or our spouse over the desires of God. And this also won't be. And you know Elijah's message? message he, he, he's bold. He, he, he socks it to us today. Elijah would basically say, if something else is God, if it really is truly God, sell out to it. Don't waver anymore. Sell out to that thing that is truly God then. He would tell us today, if money is truly God, if that's truly God, then we should do all we can to get as much as we can. And don't worry about ethical restraints. Don't worry what other people think about it. Stop being generous. Stop giving to church because that's all going to affect your net worth. Sell out to that God. He would tell us, if image is God, sell out to it. Make sure you're up to the trends. Make sure you eat well. Make sure you work out. Make sure you're doing all you can to look good. If that is God. If children are God, sell out to that God. Serve them alone. Don't listen to anyone else. Just make their happiness your priority. All the time. Don't listen to anyone else. If a thing is God, Sell out to it. Go in debt to get it. Use all your time to keep it up. Do whatever you can for that thing. But, and this is a big but, but, if that is not God, if that thing is not God, then stop waiting. Stop going through the motions of Christianity. Stop being lukewarm and quick. Give to the Lord all you got every moment of every day. Live in the light of His Word and let His Word change your life. Let His promises be your security 
And let his acts of love convince you that there is no other God like him who has saved us, who forgives us so freely, and who promises eternal life. If the Lord is God, follow him. And the beautiful thing about this command is that what God expects of our lives, he has already done for you and I. You see, God has sold out for you. And I, as your pastor, am convinced that there is no person and there is no thing that has done more for you than your Savior, Jesus Christ. He was the one who, who daily and richly provides all your needs. Any good thing that you have, any good pleasure you've experienced was from his gracious hand. He is the one that watches over us and protects us. He is the one that was willing to give his life for us and die in our place. Dear friends, is there anything or anyone who's done more? Anyone else who's given their life for you? Anyone else who's been so consistent in giving you good things? Anyone who else who, who forgives so readily? And accept so freely whenever you come to him and approach him. Dear, dear friends, I know that you're convinced like I'm convinced that the Lord, he is God. And as a spirit works in us, let's follow him. Let's give it all to God. You know, another pastor commenting on this portion of scripture, he had this to say about gods and false gods. Pastor Craig Rochelle said, you know, false gods promise what only the true God provides. I think there's profound truth here. False gods promise what only the true God provides. Because we look to money for, for what? Security? We look to an image for what? Maybe acceptance? We look to a career for what? Maybe impact? A legacy? We look to children for what? Maybe happiness? All of those things, acceptance, happiness, security, all of them are gifts from the hand of our gracious Lord. They can be found in Him as we serve Him alone. You know, Elijah's going to go on, and now he's going to, to really prove why following the Lord is the better choice. And here's the duel. Elijah sets it up, and, and here's the duel. They are going to set up altars, have fire on top of the altar, cut up a bull as a sacrifice, and they are both going to pray that the prophets of God to Baal, the prophet of the Lord to the Lord. And they are asking the Lord would send fire to burn up that sacrifice. Now the prophets of Baal thought this was a great idea. The prophet of Baal, they knew that Baal is the god of fertility. He again is in charge of bringing... Um, rain or sunshine. And so they think that the God of sunshine is able to bring fire. They're like, okay, we're in. They go first. And you want to see what happens? Please look as they go first. We pick things up in verse 26. So they took the bull, given them, and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Oh, Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. Word of God. So they do the thing. They're, they got it all set up. And you could hear a pin drop. There is no response. Now what I find next, and hopefully you'll find next, is kind of humorous what Elijah does. Um, again, they are spiritually defiant, so Elijah's not pulling any punches. Uh, defiance, um, you don't pull punches with defiance. He's laying kind of the smack down. Um, and what he is doing next is actually religiously trash talking. I'm on my team, you're on that team. We got the better team, guys. You want to see what he does? Here we go. Picking things up, um, 27. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a guy. Perhaps he's deep in thought or, or busy. Or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. 
So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time of evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. So here you got to remember the scene. Elijah is in front of the whole nation of Israel. They're spectators. And Elijah is proving how foolish these prophets are. Is your God hard of hearing? Shout louder! Maybe he's thinking. Maybe he went on vacation. Maybe he, he's just sleeping and he needs to be waking up. And, and if you're a Hebrew scholar, I got a kick out of the reading today. If you're a Hebrew scholar and read what it says literally in the Hebrew, when Elijah asks if the God is busy, he's literally asking, you know, maybe, maybe he's going to the bathroom. Maybe he's on the celestial John and he just has to take a moment before it gets back to you. Elijah knew how a trash talk, again, kind of funny. He's rubbing his nose in the fact of what he already knows. See, what Elijah knows is what they found out, that there would be no response. Because there was no one listening. <clears throat> because there is one God, and He is the Lord. You know, in the world we live in, every now and then, we see how, how foolish it is to follow false gods. And, and I won't rub your nose in it. I don't think we are spiritually defiant like they are. But maybe God is like to experience that in varying degrees. You've put all your hope, all your trust, into something that wasn't God. You thought it would deliver on what you thought it was promising, but it didn't. Trusting in money, trusting in a career, trusting in someone else to come through for us. And every now and then, God gives us a glimpse that He's the only one that can do it. Again, false God's promise for only the true God lies. So the choice for us is easy. It's a clear one. We follow the Lord. And now Elijah is going to prove that point and prove the awesome power of the Lord. We conclude now by looking at what Elijah does next. I invite you to follow along the rest of our lesson. Verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. Then they came to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. And what a sight, what a demonstration that would have been to rebuild that altar. Because again, they had torn down all the altars of the Lord. To say, this is how it should be. These are the altars of the Lord. And then with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two seas of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the wool into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water, and pour it on the offering, and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. Now why is Elijah pouring water on it? Well, if you know anything about fires, water and, and wood, uh, wet wood, don't burn so well, right? Elijah's trying to demonstrate the power of God. He goes on, At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel. Let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and have done all these things in your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil. And also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And so Elijah sees the inferno that God sent. Answered so quickly and so powerfully, it burnt up everything, including the water, including even the stones. I've never seen stones burned up, but the fire God sent was Strong enough to do that. And then the people, they were left with the easiest choice in the world. Do I follow the 
prophet of Baal and Baal, who have delivered on nothing, who have done nothing, or do I follow the Lord, who has shown his awesome power? And they say, the Lord, he is God, the Lord. Your friends, thousands of years later, we left with the same choice. Yeah, the false gods' names have changed. But what is our choice? Who do we follow? I don't know about you, but I'm going to follow the God who answers my prayer. I'm going to follow the God who sent his son to be my sacrifice. I'm going to follow the God who showed his power over death by rising from the dead on the third day. I'm going to follow the God who is above all gods, whose name is above all names, whose glory is eternal and whose power is limitless. Yes, that's the God I'm going to follow. And through the Spirit working in me, I will devote my life to following that God. For no one else has done what He has done. No one else loves like He loves. And no one else has been me. Dear friends, who are you going to choose? As the Spirit works in your hearts, you too may say, I follow the Lord. And may He give you gladness as you do that. And may He convince you regularly that He is God as He fulfills His promises to you, as He lifts you up day by day, and as He gives you all good things. For He is the Lord. Your friends, to close, let's ask God's blessing.